God bless you, and I just want to welcome you to Lakeview Church today, and would you just join me in welcoming the presence of God that's already here? Could somebody give Jesus all the praise? He's worthy of it. Amen. I also want to ask you a favor, uh, if you would help me to greet those. I'm going to look right in that mechanical missionary back there. we got a lot of people watching online and many at our Vernon campus as well and all around. Would you put your hands together one more time and show love to those on the live stream? We're so glad y'all are here with us. Thank you for joining us. And uh, I want to just welcome you to week three of our message series entitled Pray First. And last Sunday, I was actually at our Vernon campus and uh, Pastor Mark did a fantastic job of bringing what honestly is maybe the model of prayer I use most often. Uh, it's the tabernacle prayer. And uh, this morning, he and Pastor Clint are over serving in Vernon, and, and I just have the joy of sharing with you uh, what might be my favorite prayer found in Scripture. It's the prayer of Jabez. And I want to tell you a little bit why we're doing a series on prayer right in the middle of 21 days of prayer. You might think, well, pastor, y'all sure do talk about prayer a lot. And it's like, yeah, because we know we need a lot of prayer. Any honest Christians in here? Hallelujah. And I want to tell you, prayer has changed our church. Uh, many years ago, when I stepped into the role as lead pastor, I was on staff as the student pastor, worked with youth and kids, very content, very, very happy to serve in that way, served under a great a man named Pastor Porter, and he died tragically in 2014. I was very overwhelmed uh, at the thought of stepping in uh, to pastoring. When the church called upon us, Victoria and I were real unsure what was going to happen. And uh, we have state leadership. They came down and, and tried to give you know just some comfort during just what was a tragic time. And uh, over the course of several months, we went through the process. I didn't even have uh, full licensing, full certification to, you know, quote unquote, be a lead pastor. So they said, you know, we would figure out a way to, to figure that out. And, and y'all were so gracious to accept us in that role. But I was so uh, unsure of myself and unsure of, was this even what I was supposed to do? And it was scary in a lot of ways. And uh, some of the things that we're going to address in the prayer today, I think, uh, just helped me. It changed my heart. It changed my prayer life and changed my life. And, 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 in that season, I started off, actually, our state leadership, uh, we have a, a position called our state bishop or our state overseer. Uh, at the time, uh, he was actually a dear friend of mine, dear friend of our family. And after he came to, you know, like officially install me uh, one uh, service in November of 2014, we were walking outside and I, I wasn't joking, I wasn't exaggerating. I said, I don't know what I'm supposed to do now. You know, I really, I was scared. And he just grinned and said, well, just don't blow it up and you'll be fine. Uh, and you laugh, but literally that's basically all I did for the first year or two. I just was like, just don't let it blow up. And that means it's okay. And if you ever been in a season of life, you were just trying to survive, just trying to put one foot in front of the other. That's a lot what our family felt like, probably what our church family felt like. And y'all really rallied and, and, and helped us so much. But after a while, I was just so excited that, you know, things were stabilized. But I, I want to tell you that God is a God of more. Yes, and he had more in store for our church. Again, I was just glad we weren't closing the doors, but God has been opening new doors. About four years ago, uh, it was a time Pastor Mark had actually come on staff and uh, the church was growing a little bit, but we just felt like God was up to something big, and we began to investigate. We started asking churches that we saw God was obviously had his hand upon and was moving, and they, just, they looked a lot like the New Testament church, and that's what we want to be like. And so we were asking them, you know, what's your secret? You know, what is, uh, you know, the, the program that you did, or, you know, what trainings are you having that's made the change? And man, a couple of pastors said this to me, and honestly, it ticked me off. They were like, prayer. Have you ever been in a really, a crisis? And you're like, you're asking people for advice. What do I need to do? Oh, you need to pray, brother. Like, oh yeah, well, I'm fixing to lay hands on you, brother. I know that. What's the secret? But I want to tell you, we've actually had God open some great doors, and uh, you know, I say this in all humility, we've We've been seeing things happen to where 
Actually, pastors have been contacting us saying, what's happening in Iowa Park, Texas? You know, they're like, we didn't know anything good can come from Nazareth or Iowa Park. And look at what God's doing. And it opened doors at what's happening in Vernon and Wilbarger County. I'm blown away. It's already beyond what I could have dreamed of, but I'm seeing God's not even done yet. So now people are asking us, and I'm telling you, uh, we can point to one thing. And is that, that is we decided we're going to be a praying church. That this, this house will be called a house of prayer. So we have these things called 21 Days of Prayer. We do it twice a year. We pray every Saturday morning at 9 a.m. We, we have prayer small groups. We, do, we, we invest a lot in this because, y'all, I figured it out. I'm not a good enough preacher. I think we have one of the best praise teams. But we, we don't sing good enough. We don't train good enough. We don't have some secret formula. We just have the help of the Holy Spirit. And you're going to see in this prayer of Jabez a kind of prayer that will change your life. And why it's maybe my favorite uh, prayer in, in Scripture, because there's a lot of examples of prayer, models of prayer, like the Lord's Prayer or, or the Tabernacle Prayer, which we walked through last week. But there's only a few times where actually someone's literal prayer is recorded. And how many of you know God puts things and preserves things in his word on purpose for a reason? And I want you to see this prayer is in maybe one of the most unlikely of places. You're going to see just a powerful truth. In the book of First Chronicles, uh, the f- beginning of it. If you're doing a Bible reading plan like ours, how many of you are glad you're through the book of First Chronicles? Because the first several chapters are nothing but a list of Mephibosheth begat Jehoshaphat and da-da-da-da-da, and it just goes on. There's 600 of them, begats, for the first several chapters. In fact, it's not until you get to chapter 4 that there's a break in the action, and it's this man that we're going to highlight today. And I need you to see something. Of those 600, nothing said about him except they just existed. How many of you know you were created for more than just to exist? Amen. You have a purpose and a calling. And it says right here in 1 Chronicles 4, 9, Jabez was more honorable than his brothers, than his begats. His mother had named him Jabez saying, I gave birth to him in pain. We highlighted that word pain because actually the Hebrew word for Jabez can be translated as pain. Pain and sorrow. So imagine if I introduced my family to you and I said, this is my oldest, Noah Ryan. This is Eli Gray, Olivia Esther, and this is little pain and sorrow. (laughs) That's basically what his mother did to him. Y'all, that's worse than naming a boy Sue. Come on, somebody. Anybody get that reference? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Y'all go to heaven first. Hallelujah. But it's, it's unsure. We, we don't know exactly why she named him that. It could have been that she had difficulty in labor. Perhaps he was born with a disability that would cause him struggle in life. All we know is that was the identity that his mom gave him. Why would you do that to somebody? But can I tell you, saints, sometimes if we're not careful, we'll give ourselves a name, an identity that's painful. And you may not can relate to being named pain, but you can relate to identifying with pain, tragedy, shame, addiction, grief, whatever it might be. And it's it's trying to become who you are, but you're so much more than that. And God has so much more for you than just uh, those, those types of things. And so if your name was pain, I wonder what your prayer life would be like. Because I tell you what, you'll pray what you identify with. And some people, their prayers are only prayers about their pain. And so let's look at how Jabez prayed. The very next verse, he says that Jabez cried out to the God of Israel, and he doesn't start off talking about his pain. In fact, he doesn't even address it for a while. He says, oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me and keep me from harm. And now we get to it. He doesn't even ask for God to take it away. He just says, I know, God, if you do for me what you want to do, that I will be free from pain. It's one of the most powerful perspectives of prayer you'll find in Scripture. And again, God preserved it so we could be reading it right now. In the midst of our struggles, in the midst of our pain, we could see this prayer that he says, you know, here's the truth. This is not in your notes, but today's a good day. If you're a note taker, you're going to want to take notes. And if you're not a note taker, you're going to want to take notes. This is not in your notes, but it's a powerful truth that just hit me hard when I heard it. That a lot of people, your problem is not really your problem. Your problem is you don't have anything in your life greater than your problem. That's what the real issue is. See, Jabez didn't put all the focus. He was able to look past his problems to his provider, to the one true God. He knew where his help came from. He knew where his hope was found. And it's so awesome that this next line is 
in Scripture, this is what I want for you. It says, and God granted his request. It's really about the only Scripture we have that just blatantly says, he asked for this, and God granted exactly what he asked for. And notice, he never even asked God, take this pain away. He just said, God, give me what you want. Bless me the way you want. Enlarge my territory. Give me influence beyond what I have. God, let your hand be with me. Keep me from harm. And I know if you do all those things for me, there's nothing else that's going to come against me. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. This is kind of the Old Testament version of that scripture. And so I want to just share with you a few things in this prayer, I believe this prayer took notice that, that in the midst of all those begats, those, those existences that didn't really uh, amount to a whole lot to be recorded, we had this man who got God's attention because this is the kind of prayer that God is looking for. And you may be asking this, and if you'll fill in this blank, what kind of prayer should I pray when I'm in pain? Because I'm sure we all can identify with something that we go through that while we're going through it, it tries to get in our soul, tries to get in our, our hearts and trouble our minds. And I don't want to, uh, you know, discourage you in talking to God about your pain. Look, talk to him about all your cares, the Bible says, because he cares about you. Cast all your cares upon him. He cares. But I want you to see he can do more than just listen to your troubles. He can change everything. But we sometimes need to change the way that we're asking, the way that we're seeking And I want to encourage you just to replace in your prayer life, replace the focus being on your pain to the focus being on finding out, God, what is your purpose in all this? How can you make good? The Bible says that he can take what the enemy means for evil and turn it around for good. So when the enemy starts doing evil, you ought to start looking for, how's God going to turn this around for good? What What a different perspective. So I'm going to give you just four truths based on this prayer of Jabez. The first thing he prayed was, oh, that you would bless me. And I want to let you know you need to pray for blessing. That's number one. Pray for blessing. I give you permission. The word of God instructs you to pray this way. Pray for the blessing of God. In fact, in the King James Version, which is what I grew up reading, it actually says, oh, that you would bless me indeed. And that's added in because in the Hebrew language, they're, they're Grammar's a little different than ours, their punctuation. This would be like you said, bless me with like five exclamation marks. That's how a lot of commentary explains it. It's like, bless me, God. And isn't it sad that sometimes in the church world, we've got more comfortable being stressed than we have being blessed. Like, oh, I don't need to want to be blessed. That's not being humble. No, that's being pitiful. And we want the church to be powerful, not pitiful. I want you to be blessed. I pray for you to be blessed. Your heavenly Father wants you to be. You don't believe me? Let's look at the word of God. Psalm chapter 5 verse 12 says, Surely, O Lord, you bless the righteous. And don't you disqualify yourself saying, Well, I'm not righteous. The Bible says all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. So you're no worse than anybody else. But the Bible also says you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So it was never about your righteousness anyway, sweetheart. It's about how sweet our Savior is. And he says you surround them with your favor as a shield. He can bless you in that kind of way. I love Genesis 26 where it talks about Isaac, how he sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold And the Lord blessed him. And now before we move to the next verse, we're about to address a word that makes a lot of people uncomfortable in the church or a lot of people uncomfortable about the church. But it's what God said about Isaac. He said he blessed him. And it goes on to say, and the man began to prosper and continued to prosper. And he did it until he became very prosperous. And some people at this point would be like, well, what are you, some kind of prosperity preacher? Well, maybe. What are y'all, one of those prosperity churches? Is that what you are? Name it and claim it. Blab it and grab it. (laughs) Ticks me off. That's not what I'm talking about. That's not what the word is talking about. In fact, the Hebrew word here, every one of these instances, when it says the word prosper, it's a Hebrew word. You kind of got to say it like you've got popcorn stuck in the back of your throat. It's it's selach. Y'all didn't like the popcorn thing? I thought that was hilarious. All right, anyway, we'll move on. What it means is you do everything you can do and then God prospers you beyond what you could do on your own. 
So like you say, I, I'm going to be the very best husband that I can be. And then God says, and I'm going to make you even better. I'm going to be the best employee. I'm going to work hard. I want, I want people to see I do things with excellence. And God says, and I'm going to help you do beyond what you could ever do on your own. And, and I believe God has done this for our church. We're like, Lord, we're just doing what we know to do. And he says, and I'm going to do what only I can do. And I want this for you and your family. I pray this over our church family that we would be blessed and be prospered. And, and, and the word says it in, in uh, the book of 3 John, verses, uh, verse 2. It says, beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health. It's okay to want to be in good health. Just as your soul prospers. Aren't you glad God has saved your soul? Well, he doesn't want to leave the rest of you behind either. It's okay to believe for his blessing and to receive it in the name of Jesus. Let me give you a biblical definition of the word prosperity. If you'll write this down. Prosperity is having more than I need so I can make an eternal difference in the lives of others. Here's the key. We're not saying, Lord, bless me so I can just have more stuff, so I can ride around in a limousine wearing a fur coat, sitting on a gold seat. Not at all. And that's what some people think we're talking about in churches. It's really not about what we have. It's about what we are able to do. We want to have the blessing of God so that we can make a difference in the lives of others and make a difference for eternity. In Genesis 12, too, I just want to hit some high points of this scripture where God made this promise to Abraham. He said, I will bless you and you will be a blessing to others. So I pray you're blessed. I'm serious. I want you to have more than you need so you can help those in need. Because how are you going to help somebody else if you can't even help your own self? That's not good grammar, but that's good preaching. But it's reality, y'all. We need to trust God to bless us. Here's the way I would challenge you to pray it. This is, if you'll write this down, Lord, bless me with more than I need so I can be a blessing to the world around me. And let's talk about that world around you because if you have more than you need, you need a place to put it, a place to share it, right? We're not just trying to be greedy. We want to be generous with it. So some of you, don't take this as rude. I hope it'll challenge you though. Some of you, your world is not big enough. And that's why God's not blessing you any bigger, because your world ain't any bigger. He knows it would stop with you. That's why Jabez prayed the next thing. He said, Lord, enlarge my territory. Uh, the word that, that I use to remember this, that I want you to pray for is, number two, pray for influence. Enlarge my territory. Enlarge my sphere of influence. People that, that I can have impact in their lives. That they'll, they'll trust what you say. That, that your words hold weight. That they see that God has done something for you. And they want God to do that for them too. That's the way that we should believe. And the way that we should follow God. And it, it's a key word. And the word is ministry. This kind of influence is ministry. And I want you to know it's for you as much as, as it is for me. In ministry, the definition biblically is living out my faith for the benefit of others. Did you know you're all called to be ministers? See, the church, God does things so well and then people get involved. <laughs> and we make up stuff that's not even scriptural. We created these terms many centuries ago, clergy. And that's, that's supposed to be me. Do I look like clergy to you? Don't answer that. But then the word for you guys is laity, which apparently the laity just lays around and listens to the clergy clerge, whatever that is. I'm sorry I said that. But these aren't even scriptural terms. It's not even biblical. It's like, it's like there's these people up here on the pedestal, and they've got to you know, help you poor sinners just come listen to us, and maybe you'll get to go to heaven. That's not it at all. The Bible actually says we're a kingdom of priests. Which means you're just involved in ministry just as much as I am. You have influence with people that would never listen to me. That would never show up to a church service like this. And they matter to God. So your ministry matters to God. And it's living out your faith for the benefit of others. And when you pray, when you pray about God, increase my territory. Increase my influence for you. Let me challenge you in this way, not in your notes, but I hope you remember this. Don't pull God down to the smallness of your life and just pray about your little stuff and your little world, but let's allow God to pull us up to the greatness of who he is and what he's able to do. Amen? And I'm confessing to you, for a while I was just trying to survive, and then God said, oh, I can do a whole lot better than that, my son. 
And I need you to hear that in your life. God can do a whole lot better than you can do on your own. He wants to and he is sure able to prosper you in your marriage, with your children, in your finances, in your health, in your job, your calling, your career, your ministry. In the name of Jesus, I believe that. It says it in the word, Ephesians 3.20. Now to him, that's the Lord, who is able to do immeasurably, and will you say this four-letter word with me, immeasurably more. More. He's a God of more than all we ask or imagine. And I got a vivid imagination. It's according to his power that is at work within us. Within us. So you may be asking, how do I know? I mean, how can I figure out what this more is that I'm supposed to be doing? I want to show you just one example in Scripture. I think it's maybe the most clear example of what this looks like for the church today. In Acts chapter 2, verse 17, it's a prophecy. It says, in the last days. And how many of you realize we're living in the last days? Amen. Next month's message series is all about the, the glorious return. Jesus is making a comeback, y'all. Amen. Amen. And I can't wait for him to come back. But until he does, we have a work to do. And God says, in these last days, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Let me pause there, because what a lot of people think, especially in the world I I was raised in, is that an outpouring of the spirit means I'm going to get goosebumps, some people are going to shout and run around a little bit, then we're going to go eat at Luby's. That's an outpouring. You know, pour out your spirit, then we'll pour out the gravy. Hallelujah. It's about so much more than just what happens in an hour or two service. Here's what the Bible says. The very next scripture gives us the explanation. It says, when I pour out my spirit, your sons and daughters, they're going to see things. They will prophesy. They will speak things into existence that are not even there that God wants there. And your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. And that's why I've got Pastor Mark and Pastor Clint so we can dream some dreams. I'll take care of the vision. I sure hope they watch this later. (laughs) But this is the the way the Bible describes how he is pouring out his spirit. And here's the thing. God's going to do what he wants to do. The question is, will we come along and be part of what he's doing? And right here, I just want to share something. I'm going to be a little personal, well, very personal. I've never experienced anything like this. It happened yesterday when nobody could have known especially those involved in this, could have known that in this message we were going to talk about dreams and visions. And this doesn't happen often. And like I said, never has this happened in my life. That the Lord would speak to me and then confirm it in such a specific way, right away. Yesterday morning during our 9 a.m. prayer time, after we went off the live stream, I just, you can rewatch it. I just said, we're going to pray for people. And people came down and prayed. It was awesome. And man, we had people miraculously healed. Everybody believe Jesus is still in the healing business. He is. And he proves it time and time again. But that's not even the part that happened to me. Before we got to our corporate prayer time, if you've never been to our prayer gatherings, I implore you. I'm not just asking you. I'm, 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 I would beg you if, if you would let me just come. This is our last week of 21 days of prayer. We meet Monday through Friday at 6 a.m. We'll meet Saturday at 9 a.m. If you can only come Saturday, that's kind of our grand finale service. Just make effort. Bring your kids. We don't have child care because we think the kids can be in here. I want kids to experience the power of prayer and what God's doing. So just bring them to it. And I'm so blessed by how many have been showing up. But yesterday, just God did something that it could only be him. God will share his glory with no one. And he spoke in a way that was unmistakably him. While we were in our personal time of prayer, I was just by myself. I was sitting right down here, kind of kneeling with my, my, my hands, just in, you know, my, my face in my hands. And I was crying out to God, give me direction. Show me. I, I specifically said, show me how to lead your church. Where do you want us to go next? Because I kind of got some options, and I'm unsure what to do. And man, the Lord just started showing me something, and it didn't feel like it was helpful at all. You ever felt that way? You're like, God, show me something. And it makes me think of the karate kid where he's like, teach me karate. And he's like, all right, go, go wax my car. Wax on, wax off. Any of y'all know that? Daniel's son? Okay, good. Got, those of you that don't know it, sanctification's a process. God's working on it. Uh, anyway, he, he wanted to learn martial arts, and instead he started doing chores, and he didn't realize he was getting stronger doing those chores. He didn't realize the actions he was doing would help him block other people's strikes and things like that. So anyway, God kind of did this to me, and I saw, I guess you would call it a vision. I don't know. I just I couldn't unsee it, and it just I, I felt like I was walking down this path in the middle of just a field of just 
it looked like wheat or something. I'm not a farmer, but maybe wheat. And I just, I was just walking in this. I'm like, Lord, I want to see direction. And as I walked, these things just started clinging to me. I didn't know what they were. And, and just this wind blew and blew them off, knocked them off of me. I'm seeing all this sitting right down here. And then the, the terrain changed. It had been real smooth. And all of a sudden there was like, looked like rocks on either side of the path. But as I knelt to look closer, they weren't rocks. They were pieces of a wall that had been broken down. And some of y'all may recall, I don't have time to go into it. God shared with me a vision, it's been almost two years ago, about Nehemiah, about rebuilding the wall. And some things God's already been doing with our church, even what's happening in Vernon, is just some of the first steps of what God is showing me that, that, he, that he wants to do through his church. This is not my church, it's his. I'm just excited to be part of what he's doing. But while I'm processing that, you know, I'm like, okay, that didn't seem to help at all. Thank you, Lord. We were praying at the end of service. So maybe 10 minutes after the Lord showed that to me, just a woman of God came up, just one of the prayer warriors been so faithful to come, and she wrote down what the Lord showed her. Nobody could have known. I didn't have time to tell anybody. I've never had anything this specific and this quick. And here's what, what the Lord showed her. She said, I saw a vision. I saw Pastor Daniel walking through a field. As he walked, his clothes started to look dirty as things were sticking to him. I saw that. These things, I didn't know what they were. The Lord told me through this lady. He said he continued walking and the wind blew on him. And I realized that things on Daniel's clothes are actually seeds. All along the path, flowers are springing up. I saw that. That had been planted from the seeds falling off of him. The path stayed the same, but then the terrain changed. Now I saw, and now I'm seeing this in my mind's eye again. It's just overwhelming that this is so specific. Now I saw a very rocky place. And on each side of the path, flowers were springing up. How many of y'all know God can grow things in places that it wasn't supposed to grow? And... They were springing up on each side of the path right in and on the rocks. The flowers I saw were several colors and types, but the predominant color I saw was a brilliant blue. All of this is so specific to things God's been putting on my heart. And again, I'm not trying to just plug an event. It's not an event. It's just something God's called me to call the church to do. On September 10th, it's, it's uh, the second Sunday in September. That night, I'm going to share with you just, I already was going to share the vision for the year ahead, but I'm, my goodness, God has been showing me more things just in the last 24 hours that I need time to process. I want to write them down, make sure they're, they're the Lord and clearly get them out stated because I, I just can't believe what God's about to do, but I believe that God can do it and he's wanting to do it and I would love for you to be a part. So that evening at five o'clock, we're actually going to meet at the Vernon campus there in the Wilbarger Auditorium. Change your schedule if you have to. Please be part of this. I'm, I'm not trying to, I, I don't really hype things up a lot. I'm telling you, this is not hype. This is the Holy Spirit. And he's doing something unique and supernatural because God will share his glory with no one. It's really not about me. Notice in the vision there was this, this wind. That's how the Holy Spirit's identified all the time in Scripture. And it wasn't, it, it could have been me. It could have been whoever God called. I, thank you, Lord, that I get to be a part of it. But it was the Holy Spirit's work. It was causing this growth and this, these seeds. And y'all, you all, you have a dream. You have a, a, a just, God has given you a, a plan for your life. You, he created you with such a purpose. And it's time for that thing to bloom. It's time for the Lord to cause it to come to fruition. Because time is of the essence. Souls are at stake. So let's be about what God's called us to do in the name of Jesus. And I'm sorry, I'll, I'll move on. I'll, I'll share more about it. Just I'm still processing. But here's what I want you to take away from this. Is your dream can stay as small as you or be as big as God. It's your choice. Because I was real happy just to survive. And then I realized God has something much, much better. So I want to challenge you, never say never to the Lord and dream bigger dreams. Dream dreams so big that it would have to be God that answered them. You could take no credit. And then you don't have to take any of the blame either. Praise God. So the way I, I want to just remind you to pray this is, Lord, let me see what you see so that I can pursue all that you have for my life. And I've just been asking that. And at first he showed me a field. And then it's starting to make sense. So he may only show you one step at a time, but I promise you he has, he has a great plan. The next thing that Jabez prayed was for the Lord to have his hand upon him. Why do you need God's hand upon you? Why, the way I say it is pray for presence. That's number three. Pray for God's presence. Why do you need his hand upon your life? Why do you need God's presence in your life? Because God is inviting you to something that's bigger than you. That you won't be able to walk through on your own. You need his hand on your life so you can hold on to his hand to get through it. But he can, he can get you through it and make it something bigger than you could ever imagine. I love Acts 11.21. 21. 
talks about the early church and says the Lord's hand was with them and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. Why did they believe? Because they were great preaching and they put on great events? No, because God's hand was with them. And I'm telling you, the reason we pray a lot is we realize we need God a lot. And when you start to realize what God's able to do through you, in spite of you, it's exciting. It literally, the Bible says, when you're weak, you're strong. How awesome is that? So you're like, I'm really weak. You're really strong, brother and sister in Christ. Because greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. And what he's called you to, he will empower you to do it. Let me show you another word for his presence. It's his anointing comes upon your life. And anointing, biblically defined, is living my life with God's power so I can live a life beyond just Daniel. I can live a supernatural life through Jesus. Several people in Scripture realized how much they needed God. Moses did. In Exodus chapter 33, verse 15, then Moses said to God, if your presence does not go with us, and I said this, I say this just about pretty much every Sunday, because, man, I don't want to mess up. I, I don't want to miss guide you. I take very seriously my role as an under-shepherd of Jesus. And before I ever get up on this stage, I say, Holy Spirit, you've got to go with me or I don't want to go. And I'm telling you, God's asking us to do some big things. It's going to seem overwhelming, but man, I'm ready to overwhelm the enemy instead of being afraid of what the devil's doing. Let's be a little bit unsure of what God's doing, but be like, hey, we know he's doing it. And I'm just going to be part of it. Will anybody believe with me that way? And if your presence goes with us, God, if you will go with us, then send us in the name of Jesus. Don't you ever disqualify yourself. You weren't the one that qualified yourself in the first place. In 2 Corinthians 3, you may not feel up for it. You may not feel competent. Well, the word of God takes care of that too. It says not that we were competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. We know who our help comes from. He made us competent as ministers of a new covenant. Remember, I didn't even have the right preaching license to be a big boy preacher. But it's not of the letter, but of the spirit. When God calls you, don't you call yourself anything less than chosen by God. For the letter kills. Don't let anybody else determine your calling. Don't let anybody's words change the word that God has for you. Because the Spirit gives life. It can bring back to life, revive those dreams God has put in your heart. I pray it this way. And again, I just give you these so you've got an example in your prayer life. Lord, let your hand be on me because what you've called me to do is too big for me. If you didn't need God's help, that wouldn't be faith. You'd be able to figure it out. God loves when you can't figure it out. The Bible says it's impossible to please God without faith. So what he's called you to, it's bigger than you. So don't be afraid. And when you get to this point in your walk with Jesus where you get more than you need, you're praying, Lord, bless me so I can be a blessing. And you, you get a world that's bigger than you. Your sphere of influence has grown and you're impacting the world for God. And God anoints you to do it. Oh, mark my words, that's when all the hell is going to come after you. So don't be surprised. Don't be naive. Don't think it's all going to be butterflies and sunshine. But that shouldn't really distress you. Don't, don't be freaked out. If you're under the attack of the enemy, don't be discouraged. In fact, that may be the biggest compliment you could ever get. Because if you're not butting heads with the devil, it may be because you're walking alongside him. I want to get in his way. And tell him, you got to get out of my way because the gates of hell cannot prevail against me because I'm part of the body of Christ, the church of the living God. So, devil, you're going the wrong way if you're getting in my way. Anybody with me? In the name of Jesus.
We need to quit letting him have territory that doesn't belong to him. God, enlarge the territory of these people of God, of the body of Christ globally. Go into the highways and byways, the places that have been staked out as drug houses and trap houses, places where illicit things happen and abuses are happening. God, we claim those. This earth is your footstool. You created all of it good. And I don't care that we're the ones that messed messed it up. You use us to make all things new like you do. In the name of Jesus. Praise God. That's the God we serve. That's what he's able to do. So don't worry if you don't know how to do it. That's kind of the point. Pray for his presence. And then the last thing that he prayed was, Lord, keep me from harm. And I want to encourage you, pray for protection. Because the devil's going to come after you. Let him be met with the strong man who lives inside of you. Pray for God's protection. Preventative. Don't wait until... Something's already happening. That's what a lot of people do. They only cry out when they're in crisis. Jabez cried out. He just cried out, Lord, bless me. First thing, bless me. Enlarge my territory. Have your hand upon me and keep me from harm. And Then he got to the thing he was named after. Then, I know, if you do in my life what you want to do, I'll be free from pain. Man, what faith. What a powerful way to pray. 1 Peter 5 verses 8 and 9 tells us we have an enemy. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. That's what he's doing. Here's what we're supposed to do. Resist him. And the Bible says when you resist him, he has no option. He has to flee. That's the word of God standing firm in the faith. And again, I'm going to try again to invite you. Be a part of these, this last week of 21 days of prayer. Tomorrow morning, 6 a.m., if you've got your 21 days of prayer, uh, daily focus, we've got a few more back there on the table. You can take them. They're free. Tomorrow, Monday morning, we're going to confront spiritual warfare. We're going to do warfare prayers. I don't have time to teach all of it. I'm going to expound on it a lot tomorrow morning. But some of you, it's time you tell the devil he needs to leave your family alone. I'm praying for some godly men to wake up every morning and say, I claim my family. I claim my marriage. I resist the enemy. In the name of Jesus, some moms, a prayer over those babies. I resist. I declare the favor of the Lord. I declare good godly friends in their life. I declare I don't care what's going on in this world. God can make a difference in their world. In the name of Jesus, for spiritual mothers and fathers to rise up, pray over our church. Pray over this community. This nation needs prayer. It needs Jesus. Well, guess what? We're the body of Christ. And it needs us to rise up, wake up, and pray up in the name of the Lord. Spiritual warfare, let me give you this definition. It's confronting the enemy with the authority of God's name, the truth of the word. Replace every one of the devil's lies with the truth of the word and the power of the cross. Thank you, Jesus, that when you said it is finished, you meant it. The battle is already over. The devil's just too dumb to realize it. He's already defeated. So you don't go into battle trying to win. You just go in to claim the victory. To say, I just showed up. You're like that person at the party. You didn't help set anything up, but you're going to eat all the cake. Hallelujah. I just showed up for the good stuff. I just came to claim the spoils that my God already won for me. That Jesus paid for me at the cross. You don't believe me? Believe the words of Jesus in Luke 10, 19. Last scripture I'm going to read to you. He said, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions. And might I add bats? (laughs) Just in case you don't get that reference. Friday morning, if you don't watch the prayer, we live stream prayer at 6 a.m. on Friday. Uh, There were two bats in the building, in the sanctuary, on the ceiling as they were getting ready for prayer. And actually, at first, I, I didn't realize it was two bats. I thought it was a bat and a robin. Anyway, see, the, the Holy Spirit's just flowing. I can't help it. Yeah, thank you for that pity applause. That was awesome. Uh, but it's so real. Y'all, look, demons are real. 
But the Bible says we really have authority over them. Jesus said this. This is not from the mouth of some feel-good, you know, just charismatic preacher. This is the words of Christ himself. He said, I, the Lord Jesus, have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions. That's a type or a shadow of demonic forces. And that, that means when you're walking for the Lord, you're just following his path. Not only can the devil not stop you from staying, moving forward, you just walk right over those bad boys and trample on them in the name of the Lord. I give you power to overcome all the power of the enemy and then why would Jesus say it if it's not true? Nothing will harm you. No weapon formed against you will prosper. That's what the Bible says. So don't be surprised when the devil brings a new weapon because the last one didn't work and he's just too stupid to realize the next one's not going to work any better than the last one. And as long as you won't doubt, as long as you'll just trust God is your protector, as long as you'll pray this way, I pray this over you a lot. Lord, Strengthen me in and rescue me from every attack of the enemy. I pray for your protection over my life, over my family. But God, you've increased my influence. I prayed over my church family. And look, your family is my family. I pray over your loved ones because you love them. They're important to God. They're important to me. God cares about them, and we, we just pray, Lord, strengthen me. When we go through the battle, the awesome thing is even when you're in the battle, God can teach you something. He can grow something. That, that, that in the middle, he's just going to teach you how to say, peace, be still. He's going to show you how to do things the way Jesus taught us to do things. And then ultimately, he's going to rescue you. At some point, we're going to get out of this old world, but I want to get as much out of it for the kingdom's sake before we get out of here. I want to see as many souls saved as possible with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So one last time, I'm going to remind you, we're right in the middle of 21 days of prayer. It goes until August 26th. That's this Saturday at 9 a.m. But come Monday through Friday at 6 a.m., at least watch on the live stream if you can. Get a, a daily prayer guide. I've got one around here somewhere. I about worn mine out. Just look, These are completely free. They're, they're on the information table, or one of our First Impressions team can help you find one. We're going to be walking through warfare prayers tomorrow, and all the rest of this week, we're going to be praying for those who need to know God. So if you've got lost loved ones, if you're believing with us for God to just reach a harvest with the gospel, that's how we're praying. That's how we're believing this final week. And I believe in God to send real revival in the name of Jesus. I want to ask if you would to stand with me. Would the worship team please come? Would the prayer team come forward at this time? I'm about to dismiss you. But I want to give the Lord just opportunity to minister to you through these ministers standing before you. These people are prayed up. We're believing. God, we've been, we've been seeing God do miracles. And why not you? Why not yours? Why not now? So before you leave, if you have a prayer need for anything, a couple of things you can do. Again, we do what we can do, and then God does what only he can do. Will you write that prayer request down on a connection card? Put it in the prayer box. We'll pray over it all the rest of this week and, and on Saturdays. We keep those for a long time and just pray in agreement over them. But I want to challenge you before you leave, do something better. Come let somebody pray in agreement with you. I tell you, it won't hurt nothing, but it sure might change everything. Just that step of faith. So I'm going to pray a prayer of dismissal so that nobody feels on the spot, those on our live feed. If you've got a prayer need, you can send it in in the comments of this video or lakeviewpeople.com slash prayer. We'll write those down and pray over those during 21 days of prayer and agree with you as well. But right now, don't miss this opportunity. We're just going to do what the Word says. We're going to lay hands on you and just believe, like the Bible says, for you to recover if you need healing, you to be delivered if you need deliverance. Because it's really not about us, but it's about He who is inside of us. So if you'd allow us to pray for you, we're just going to pray the prayer of faith. And the Word says the prayer of, pa prayer of faith will save you and the Lord will lift you up in the name of Jesus. Let me pray a blessing over you. The worship team is just going to cover us in worship as you're dismissed. But you move at any time. You're not interrupting me. Will you move now if you need prayer? Or at any point while people are leaving, if you just feel called, we'll, we'll, these altars will be open and we'll stay and pray. Lord, I pray over these precious men and women of God. But God, they got to go back to their, their daily lives. And I know sometimes things are hard and scary and, and can just feel overwhelming. Lord, I pray you would overwhelm them with your love. Overwhelm them just with trust in your word that what you say is true that you want to bless us you want to increase 
our ability to reach people and to have influence in this world for you. That you, you have your hand upon us. Anoint them, I pray, God. Let them know your hand is upon them. You, you can prosper them to be that better husband, be that better mother, be, be that better friend, that employee. Whatever it is you've called them to do, God, you'll equip them to do it. And God, protect us against the enemy and just let us give you all the glory, all the praise. In the name of Jesus, I pray, and all God's people said, Man, will somebody join me in giving the Lord praise? He's worthy of it. Hallelujah. God bless you, church. You're dismissed in the name of the Lord Jesus. If you need prayer, we'll stay and pray as long as you need. God bless you. Go with God and know he goes with you.